Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth and we receive it. Thank you for all that you bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on the subject of redemption from some time and we've been recently most talking about the, the uh, area of the blood of Jesus. We talked about the blood of Jesus. We saw, first of all, from the Old Testament types, how they pointed towards the work of Jesus Christ and then the last session we talked about the application and the results of it, looking at it from a New Testament standpoint of those scriptures. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, bringing a summary of what the blood does, but also addressing the fact that there are unscriptural traditions about the blood which must be understood so we do not follow them. We can only follow what is in line with the truth. First of all, we see in 1 John 1, 7, if we walk... And this word is a ongoing verb, present tense, meaning continuous action. You and I are the ones responsible to do it, active voice. God's not going to make you do this. Subjunctive mood means it's a conditional statement, meaning it's conditional upon you doing it. So the way you would translate it is, if we may be actively, continually walking in the light, which would be in line with the word, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Well, that means who am I going to have fellowship with? Only those who are going to walk in the light. I'm not going to have fellowship with people. I can minister to anybody and talk to them, but I'm only going to have fellowship with those who are walking in the light. And then what will happen also if I walk in the light? The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. And when it speaks here about this cleansing, this is present tense, ongoing action, Active meaning that Jesus, who is in control of his blood, his blood will actively work to keep us cleansed ongoingly from all sin because we're not walking in sin any longer. We're now walking in the light of the Word of God. So this shows us how the blood is going to be applied. It's going to be applied here if you and I meet the conditions of walking in the light. Now suppose we do sin. 1 John 1.9 if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. It says here to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do have to point out that there are three subjunctive mood verbs in this sentence, so it's important to understand what's truly being said. If we confess, and that is a conditional statement, subjunctive mood, if we may be confessing our sins whenever we might commit them, he is faithful and he is just or righteous, not to forgive us our sins just because we confess them. No, because this is a subjunctive mood verb as well. That he might forgive us our sins if conditions are met. Meaning, we'd have to stop sinning, turn away from them. Not just confess them and continue. We'd have to turn away from them. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This again is not an infinitive this is a subjunctive mood verb, meaning that he might cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that means we're going to have to put away sin. We're going to have to walk in the way of righteousness. We're going to have to not yield to this any longer anything that's unrighteous. Otherwise, there's got to be an absolute change. There's got to be true repentance, a godly sorrow that works repentance in our life. If we are going to see forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness as we get rid of every evil thing of unrighteousness out of our life. So, the blood of Jesus Christ will be applied if we are walking in the light continually, and it will be applied to us if, having sinned, we have confessed our sin, we have repented of it, we have turned away from it, we have met the conditions to be forgiven, and we have gotten rid of this, we're now walking in the way of righteousness, we're cleansed from all unrighteousness because we're not walking in it any longer, we're now doing what is right in God's sight. That's how the blood of Jesus is applied, and is applied by Jesus. Remember that the blood is on the mercy seat in heaven, and we see what it speaks about in Hebrews 12, 24, when it's speaking about the church of the firstborns, the general assembly written in heaven, the God of judge of all the spirits of the righteous ones having been made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling. Where is it at? It's in heaven, on the mercy seat in heaven. That speaketh better things than that of Abel's. 
uh, is, is called for judgment, but this speaks of calling for mercy, for blessing, for bringing forth the work of God in our life to bring us to the place, of course, being cleansed continually, being restored, the work of the blood covenant in our life, all the things that it will do as we come into the, the new covenant now through what Jesus has accomplished for us. So this is the blood that's in heaven. So the blood in heaven, speaking of better things, will be applied by Jesus when we meet those conditions of walking in the light as he is in the light and or if we've sinned, confessing sin, because remember, we don't have to sin any longer because of the fact that we now are not a sinner any longer. And now the things that are written to us in the New Testament, if we will do them, we won't sin. First John 2, 1, my little children, these things write I unto you, what the things of the word of God, that you might not sin. This again, subjunctive mood, meaning you could, but that you might not sin. So if we do the word, we won't sin any longer. And then, of course, the blood of Jesus will be cleansed, continually cleansing us. Now, if any man might sin, again, he doesn't have to sin, but he could sin. If he might sin, subjunctive mood, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is our helper, the one alongside to help us, our heavenly attorney, so to speak, that when we confess our sins, he's going to take then that and we've met the conditions then, he will forgive us, he will cleanse us, the blood of Jesus will be applied. And having said that, we want to address the unscriptural tradition today, which is prevalent in the body of Christ and has been going on for a long time, been taught, and that is that we are to plead the blood and the blood is used by us to conquer the enemy, to defeat the enemy, to do all kinds of things. This is a false tradition of men. Where has this come from? It has come from a misunderstanding of Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, where it says, they overcame him, and this is speaking of the devil, by the blood of the lamb. Well, it looks like we put the blood in operation, and we'll overcome the devil, and they think that I can do something with the blood to overcome him. Well, first of all, we have to look at what this is saying here, because when you see an and, well, that means it links together what was previously said with what's about to be said. What was previously said? I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation, strength, kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God, our God day and night. So who's that? That's the devil. And what's he been doing? Accusing us of what? of our sins. He certainly doesn't accuse us of walking in the ways of righteousness. <laughs> he accuses us of our sins. Why? It gives him a legal right according to spiritual law to, because we've given place to him to bring destructive effects against us. So, they overcame him in what way? His works? No, his accusations. Why did they overcome his accusations? not by the blood of the lamb like they did something of it, because this word is dia in the Greek. And when dia is followed by accusative article and accusative noun, it means because of. In other words, they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb. And the same with the word here, dia again. And this also has accusative definite article and accusative noun after it. So what it's saying is, as Young's brings out, they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. Well, what's the word of their testimony said? It said they've been walking in line with the word of God. And what about the blood because of the blood of the Lamb? The blood of the Lamb has been applied. It was applied because they've been walking in the light. Well, because of the word of their testimony and the blood having been applied, because they're walking in line with the word, that's how they overcome his accusations. This is what it's talking about. It's not talking about using the blood as a weapon. It's not talking about using the blood against the enemy. It's not talking about us doing anything with the blood. It's the blood has been applied because we met the conditions of walking in line with the word of God. So the blood is applied and the word of our testimony shows the fact that we have a testimony of walking in the light as he is in the light. Further, notice it says, they love not their lives unto the death. 
This means that it didn't stop the works. So the blood of Jesus does not stop the works of the devil. What it does is it makes sure that his accusations are not successful. And of course, then he doesn't have place to work against us in our life. Now we're going to go over about 40 different statements, just going over these to show you the false things that are being taught. First one is that people say that the blood of Jesus is an offensive weapon against the devil. They've been saying this. I've read, read it in books, read it in articles, read it and heard it in messages, heard it from people, you know, when I was a young Christian would say these things. It's not true at all. It is not a weapon whatsoever. Is it ever used in the armor of God listed there? No. You look at Ephesians chapter 6, it's not there. Was it ever used in the book of Acts by the church in using it against the enemy? Never. They always used the Word of God, they used the name of Jesus, and they did the things by the power of the Holy Spirit. They did not use the, do anything with the blood whatsoever. The blood all has to do with the relationship with God applied by Him because we're walking in line with the Word. A second thing that's said is, well, it's a defensive weapon. I'm going to hold up the blood to be defended. Again, it has nothing to do with a weapon against the enemy. It's not a defensive weapon. Remember, this is not talking about using the blood against the enemy. This is talking about the accusations that he made were groundless. They were not successful because of the fact that we have the blood been applied by Jesus because of the word of our testimony, because we've been walking in line with the word. Another thing that people have said often is we need to remind Satan about the blood. Do we need to remind Satan about the blood? No. Here he understands what happened. <laughs> Did the blood, you know, reminding Satan about the blood, what does that do for you? It does nothing. Is that going to conquer the enemy? Is that going to make him tremble and so forth and run away and so forth? Is that going to cast out the demons? No. Are we ever, has this ever been done in the Word? No. Are we ever told in the Bible to remind Satan about the blood? No. Well then, it must be a false tradition, and it is a false tradition. A fourth thing, and this is a common thing, is we are to cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus. Did anybody cover themselves with the blood of Jesus in the Word of God? Nowhere did they do such a thing. We do not cover ourselves or they think you cover yourselves, your loved ones, your possessions, everything that you have. Is it scriptural? Absolutely not. Whose blood is it? It's Jesus' blood. Where is it? It's in heaven. Who applies it? Jesus does. When? When we meet the conditions of either walking in the light as he is in the light and or having sinned, confess our sin, come to repentance so that we will be forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness. Jesus is the one who's in charge of the blood we do not do anything to cover ourselves with the blood. Now, what's going, to, what's going to protect us? It's the angels of God that are going to protect us. And we've looked at some of these scriptures. We're not going to look at them all, just a couple of the scriptures. What will the angels do? The angels, when we meet the conditions, will be put in operation to protect us. Remember what it says in Psalms 91.10, They'll shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep or guard thee in all thy ways. The angels are what protects us. And remember out of Psalms 34, verse 7, When we meet the conditions, the angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him and delivers them. So the angels will protect us if we meet the conditions. We don't do anything with the blood of covering ourselves with the blood. This brings us to the next point, and this is the first thing that most people will say after that. They'll say, no, wait a minute. What about in Exodus chapter 12 when the blood were put on the doorposts? Well, let's take a look at what was going on in Exodus chapter 12 thinking that, well, if I put it on the doorpost, I'm supposed to put it on my house. Well, after that, did anybody ever be instructed to put it on the, of their house or doorpost or anything? Never. It was only at that time. So, any, was it ever done in the New Testament? Never. Never at all. What was going on here? Exodus 12:12 12, 12 says, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, 
Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So this is when God is bringing judgment against Egypt. The blood shall be for you to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So what did the blood do? Did it protect him from the devil? No, it didn't have anything to do with protecting him from the devil. The blood had protected him from God's judgment. Why would God bring judgment? Because of sin and having not walked in the ways of the Lord. So does this have putting on the blood on your house, does that guarantee that you're going to be protected? Well, you're not going to be protected from the devil, but could that mean I'm going to be protected from God's judgment? No. I put the blood on there, but I'm sinning in my house. <laughs> well, am I going to be protected? No, I'm going to get judged because you walk in sin, you're going to have judgment. Putting the blood on the house is simply showing forth the fact that the blood is what is going to protect you from God's judgment when he brings judgment because the blood is applied. And it's really pointing towards the fact that what are you and I now? We are the spiritual house of God. And how is the blood applied to us, the spiritual house of God? Not because we put it on us in some way. It's because it's been applied to us because we met the conditions of walking in the light as he is in the light. And we have, of course, then not con we've confessed our sins. We're not walking in the way of sin, so there'll be no place for it. So the point being is, what is Exodus 12 talking about? It's talking about God's judgment. So what did the blood do? It protected him from God's judgment. Did it protect him from the devil? No, not at all. And then the next thing that people will say, well, about with Joshua in chapter 2. In Joshua chapter 2, remember this is where Rahab was hiding the men that had came in to search out the land before they were going to bring judgment. God was going to bring judgment on Jericho. And so the king of Jericho came to Rahab saying, bring forth the men that have come to thee, which enter in thy house. They become to search out all the country. And so she went and she hid the men. Because she hid the men, then of course she was going to be protected. And when we come down here, we see that her testimony, she, they knew what the, 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 who the Lord was. And in verse 12, she said, I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I've showed you kindness in hiding them, that you also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. You'll save alive my father, my mother, my brother, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And he did. So they were going to be delivered, get delivered. And he comes and talks about this cord that they were let down through the, the window when they escaped. And he said here that in verse 18, when we come in the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread which speaks of the blood, in the window which thou dost let us down by. Thou shalt bring thy father and mother and brethren all the father's household home unto thee. And then they would be protected. So what was going on here? This is when Jericho was going to be destroyed by God. That, that, tell us, that tells us the fact that the scarlet thread was going to protect Rahab, who did the right thing before God to hide them. And it had nothing to do with protecting them from the enemy. Instead, it was a judgment upon the enemy coming. So this is, instead, this is the protection from God's judgment. So the blood only has to do with protection from God's judgment. So we don't plead the blood whatsoever. There is, is there any scripture on pleading the blood in the Bible? No, not at all. You don't see it anywhere. It's all been manufactured by people who thought that that's what they were supposed to do as they saw it on the house, or they thought that this, by putting it in the window that that was referring to being delivered and protected from God's judgment, but it has, or excuse me, from, the, from Satan and the enemy. But no, it had nothing to do with that. The blood protects us from God's judgment because it's how it shows that we're right with him because we're walking in line with the word. Another thing that people say is when we plead the blood, it pleads for us crying mercy from the mercy seat. Do we need to plead the blood for it to cry mercy? No, it already does cry mercy because it's already there. It has nothing to do with it. And how can you see the mercy of God come? 
not just because you decide you're going to plead the blood for the mercy to be released. No, you've got to meet the conditions for the mercy and come and take hold of it. It's already available for you and me. That's why it tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy, and we may find grace and to help in time of need. These are subjunctive mood, conditional statements. That means the fact mercy is available, we, we just come and take hold of it. It's not like we plead the blood in order for that mercy to be released. No, it's already speaks that but we have to come and take hold of it. So the blood has nothing to do with seeing mercy be released. Another guy, a songwriter, said the spirit answers to the blood. These guys come up with all kinds of things. Where does the Bible say that the spirit answers to the blood? No place. What does the spirit do? He performs the word, doesn't he? And he takes the things from above and shows them unto us. He's a performer of the Word of God and brings revelation. All the things that talks about the Holy Spirit, they, none, none of them ever does it say that he answers to the blood. Again, these people just manufactured these things out of their mind. They were listening to whatever voice came to them or whatever they wanted to believe or from some teaching that they had, but there's no scripture on it. That's why you can't be writing songs that are contrary to the word. Another thing that people say, well, why do the demons get all stirred up when people talk about the blood? Well, the blood redeemed us. Of course, they don't like to hear about the blood because the blood accomplished the redemption, accomplished the reconciliation, brought us in right relationship with him, brought us to the place now in the new covenant coming into being. You know, all the things that Jesus Christ accomplished. And of course, if they would have known about what was going on, they'd have never crucified the Lord of glory. That was a big mistake. It certainly would be upsetting or be disturbing to them to talk about that. But it has nothing to do with conquering the enemy whatsoever. Another person said, no wise Christian would ever try to cast out demons without consciously pleading the blood, thinking that that's going to protect them before they cast out demons. It has nothing to do with that. What's going to keep us right? Because we've confessed our sins. We have been forgiven. We have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus because we met the conditions. It has nothing to do with it. In fact, how are we going to cast out the demons? Again, he's thinking that you do this with the blood. No, we're going to cast out the demons in the name of Jesus. Remember what it says. How do we cast out the demons? We cast them out, Mark chapter 16, verse 17. In my name shall they cast out the devils. The name is what gives us the authority to command the demons to come out. And that's how the demons are going to be cast out. Another people, they teach the fact that, uh, that pleading the blood is the way people receive the Holy Spirit. I've heard people talk of that one. It's crazy when you think about it. Is there any scripture that indicates that pleading the blood will have anything to do with receiving the Holy Spirit? No. The Holy Spirit's a promise, remember? Holy Spirit a promise. First root of our inheritance. It's what we make a demand to what's due us because it's a promise of God. And so how do we receive the Holy Spirit? We come to the Father to receive the Holy Spirit once we're born from above. Do we have anything to do with the blood, being pleading the blood, causing a person to receive the Holy Spirit? It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. Again, false teachings. They also say that you're to cover your loved ones with the blood of Jesus. Well, that's not so. Furthermore, you couldn't stop the devil from working in your loved ones if they're walking in sin, even if the blood, you could do such a thing. They're going to get wiped out by the attacks of the enemy because of sin. You have opened the door to the devil, giving place to him. And you couldn't cover someone else, even if it was a scriptural thing. They have to deal, they'd have to do, deal with their sins and be sure they're right. Of course, covering the blood of someone is totally unscriptural. We don't do it with ourselves, and we don't do it with our loved ones. There's no scripture on it whatsoever. Nobody ever did it. If that was the case, we'd just cover everybody in the whole world with the blood and everybody would be fine. <laughs> That's crazy. It's not the truth whatsoever. Another thing is that we must realize that everybody who thinks that they're applying the blood, they think that they're doing this in faith. Many times they say, well, you've got to apply the blood in faith. That's, a, that's, a, that's showing your faith. No, it's not. 
Your faith is doing what the Word says, hearing and doing the Word, speaking the Word, holding fast your confession, acting on the Word, working your faith in some aspect of doing the Word. How does faith come? By hearing the Word. How do we put our faith in operation? By working our faith, by doing what the Word says. It has nothing to do with putting our faith, applying the blood in faith. Of course, this is thinking that you're supposed to do something with the blood. Another thing that people will say is that, that when we plead the blood, it's a valid expression of our faith in that blood. We are to have faith in the blood. It does say so in Romans chapter 3. But what is our faith in the blood? Not that it's going to be a pl uh, uh, pled or some reason, whatever. No, God set forth to be a perpetuation through faith in his blood. What's our faith in the blood? What has blood accomplished? And what was that? It accomplished the redemption. It's what now is on the mercy seat. So that now it's the blood of the new covenant. It now is that which has put us in right relationship with God. So that now we are, can be cleansed, of course, and be right with God because, and we, of course we can conquer all his accusations. So, but thinking that you're to have faith in the blood by pleading the blood is what they think. Again, that's wrong. How would we show any kind of faith in the blood? We just we believe what he accomplished and we receive Jesus. And we walk in line with the word so we understand the blood is to be applied by Jesus to keep us in a cleansed state. Otherwise, we'd be doing what the word says to show this forth. Another guy, and this is quite an amazing one. This one's, I read it in books and heard it in different times. One admits that pleading the blood's not in the Bible. Oh. First, one of the first people that's done, most of them, they don't want to talk about that. But then he says, after that, the phrase Sunday school is not in the Bible either. Well, that's true. And so he implies that this concept of having Sunday school is okay because it's not in the Bible. So pleading the blood's okay, even though it's not in the Bible too. What kind of mentality is that? That's crazy. It's in a book. It's one of the books written out there that, you know, was a popular book. And this person also then says his conclusion was, he brought up Colossians 1.10, that we're increasing in knowledge. Otherwise, we're getting more knowledge to show us what to do. What does that imply? Well, we're getting extra biblical knowledge, you know, that shows us things that aren't written in the Bible that we're supposed to do. Do we partake of any extra biblical knowledge? No, that's deceiving us. That's what we see happen so often with people listening to other things, Jewish fables, things that are not a part of the canon of scripture, total error. So this again leads people to think that there's further revelation outside of the word. What's increasing in knowledge referred to? Getting more knowledge of the word of God, not something outside of the word of God. But these are the kind of things that people say. One guy says, I, I ask God to cover me with the blood every day because he realized he can't do anything with the blood. But he thinks think still he won't let go of this covering of the blood. So I'm going to ask God to cover me. You don't ask God to cover you. You meet the conditions for him to apply it. It cleanses you. It doesn't, it's covering. Actually, covering of the blood, remember, we pointed out, was an Old Testament thing. That's what they did in the Old Testament. Is that New Testament for today? No. Remember what the high priest did, Exodus chapter 30, verse 10, when Aaron made an atonement. What was that? That was the covering, where once in the year he made a atonement, a covering with the blood of the sin offering throughout their generations. It was, a, they put it there on the mercy seat once a year in the Old Testament tabernacle, the physical one, and that was simply a covering over for sin. Is that in the New Testament? No. <laughs> he did Jesus by one sacrifice now, accomplished the redemption, and so now he did. There's no covering for sin anymore. It's now the blood of Jesus Christ has accomplished the redemption, doing away with that penalty for mankind in general because he made peace with God through his blood because he paid the price for us. So, we don't do anything with the blood, and we certainly don't ask God to cover us with it in the New Testament. That's all false whatsoever. 
Another guy says, well, we cover the, ourselves with the blood to appropriate all the benefits of the cross. Protection, forgiveness, redemption, reconciliation, cleansing, sanctification, dwelling in His presence, victory. They think the blood brings everything, all these promises to pass. Does the blood bring any promises to pass? No, it's the faith that brings the promises to pass as you take hold of the promises of God and do what the Word says. Remember, the blood is what keeps you cleansed, keeps you in right with, with the Lord so that, that you will, He will accomplish His Word and bring His promises to pass in your life. Here's another guy who says, well, the blood doesn't cover us automatically, but you have to ask for the protection of the blood. Again, if they see you know, I'm not, I'm not supposed to do it, and it doesn't cover me automatically. I've got to ask him to do it. Again, this is all people just grasping at whatever they can to try to keep their tradition. They're going to kind of switch it around a little bit. <laughs> no, we don't do anything, and that's not what, quote, protects us from the devil. Instead, it's what has us being right with God because we've met the conditions, so we will not be judged by God whatsoever. And the one guy, of course, he says, how often do we need to ask God to cover us with the blood? They, need, they come up with all kinds of doctrinal things after that. He says, every time, every time we go out the door, every time we pray, every time we do anything. <laughs> Again, that's ridiculous. What keeps us cleansed? If we're walking in the light. If we're walking in the light, then we're continually cleansed. Do we need to ask him or even to pray for the blood to be applied? No. It's all whether or not you're walking in line with the Word of God. Another statement, I heard this often, Satan can't touch me because I'm covered with the blood. No, not so. I've heard people say that and they say, well, well I, I covered my car with the blood and covered myself and had an accident. What happened here? The answer is, that didn't do any good. Has nothing to do with protecting you. What happened there? Did you disobey the law or something, or you know, made a mistake, ran a stop sign or whatever, and you got an accident? That can be the reason why something happened. It has nothing to do with this because you can't cover yourself with the blood, and Satan can attack you regardless. Even if you had the blood applied, remember he can try to come against you without cause. We know that. So. That's so. Now, of course, another thing is if the blood covers us and that's what everybody's going to do, what do we need angels for? <laughs> you know, there'd be no reason. Who is responsible for doing the protection? It is the angels that protect us from the enemy. Another one to say the blood, people say this often, I heard this one a lot. The blood of Jesus is against you, devil, to drive the demons out of the person. The blood of Jesus is against you. Totally false. Just like the same guy wants to hold a cross up or wants to hold a Bible up against him or all kinds of ways, you know. It has nothing to do with it at all. How do we cast out the demons? We command them to come out in the name of Jesus by speaking to them by their function. It has nothing to do with this whatsoever. And then, then there's some people that have done this. And they say, well, we ask God to cover us with the blood of Jesus. He honors that because the blood represents the name of Jesus and what the name's all about. Now we're twisting some things. And they think the name is the authority or power, you know, authority we have. And the blood, blood is this life given to redeem us and ratify us. So we can use the blood or the name <coughs> in conquering the enemy. Now they're going to bring this over to mean the same thing. Think I can use the blood of Jesus or I can use the name of Jesus. You know, they both refer to something that Jesus would do. No, they're totally different application. The blood is applied by Jesus when you met the conditions to be right with him and cleansed. The name is used to have, use authority to cast out the demons. We pray in the name of Jesus to take hold of promises. We don't pray in the blood of Jesus to take promises. We pray in the name of Jesus, bringing his high priestly ministry in operation. And of course, someone says, well, you, you can do things by the blood or by the name, whichever you want to do. Well, is that what the Bible says? Does the Bible ever say that we're supposed to do things in the blood of Jesus? Never. But what does it say about the name of Jesus? Colossians 3.17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We do everything in the name of Jesus. We do nothing in the blood of Jesus. 
We do everything in the name of Jesus. That shows you the fact, again, that people are just grasping whatever they can to try to hold on to traditions of men. Of course, bleeding the blood against the devil never was done any place in the New Testament. No one ever did it. Then another one that you'll hear common is, well, I'm going to draw a bloodline around my property, and therefore I'll be protected. <laughs> That's not going to protect you. You walk in sin, the devil's going to have operation against you. Is anybody ever seen, I'm supposed to go and draw a bloodline around my property so everything will, be, everything will be protected from everything? No. Again, it's all thinking that the blood is what is going to protect you from the devil. It's just total deception. Another guy, these are ministers and preachers and teachers and people who wrote books and supposedly authorities that said all this. This isn't just anybody out there. They've said these things too, but this has all come from pastors, teachers, people who taught, wrote books on it and all kinds of things. Another one, a minister says, oh, I'm redeemed by the blood, saying that is pleading the blood. That the, if I say I'm redeemed by the blood, what have I done? I've just made a statement of fact according to the Word of God. Did that plead the blood or do anything about the blood? No. Not whatsoever. I'm just making a confession of what Jesus Christ accomplished for me. But again, people want to twist things. These are when people twist, and you know, it talks about resting the scriptures. They'll try to rest the scriptures, twist them to mean something that they want it to mean to keep their traditions. Another one says it's our responsibility to sprinkle the blood. Not so. It's sprinkled from heaven, as we saw in Hebrews chapter 12. And Jesus is the one who applies it. Another one says, I bring to bear the power of the blood of Jesus to, to bind you. Thinking that the power of the blood is going to bind the devil. That's another one people said. Does the blood of Jesus bind the devil? Do, is any place we see that? No. How do we bind the devil? We speak words of command, of authority, binding them in the name of Jesus. That's how we do things. We see that people are holding the blood against the devil until victory comes. That's another common thing. And they always want to talk about the blood. You know, there was always that song about there's power, power, wonder working in the power. Remember that one, the blood, you know, and they always want to claim the blood and speak the blood and all this. <laughs> Not true. It's false. There's cleansing in the blood of Paul applied by the Lord when you meet the conditions, but it's not power used against the enemy. Again, these are all false things that are, that are said. And another minister says that uh, this is a major weapon against Satan. Again, as we pointed out, there's no place that it's ever a weapon anywhere against Satan. It's all lies. These are all ministers. I don't know where they got all this stuff from, because they certainly didn't have chapter and verse for any of it. Another minister says the name and the blood are not in competition with each other. You, you can use either one. Oh, there have been people especially some of these ones who wrote books and they were just champions for this and they were on all kind of TV programs and radio programs and, and did seminars and all these things all over the country and all, even all over the world declaring this. All false. The blood and the name are different. The blood is applied by Jesus when we've met the conditions to be cleansed and to be right with Him. The name is used to take hold of promises when we pray or to use to cast out the demons or we do everything in the name of Jesus when we're going and accomplishing the works of the Lord. Everything is done. The works are always done by the name of Jesus, not by the blood. Another one says that, uh, that you know, you use the blood to t is you're using your God-given authority. They want to bring it over into the area of authority. It has nothing to do with authority. If it was, we would see the scriptures teaching us all over the place that if you're, for you to operate in authority, you're going to speak in the blood of Jesus or you're going to do something with the blood of Jesus. Again, it's all false. Was it ever used in the book of Acts for anything? No. What was used? The word of God, the name of Jesus. They would pray. They would put the angels in operation. The angels are the ones that go forth and protect us. So, Especially the things that people will bring up is that Exodus 12, the answer is it was protecting them from God's judgment, not from the enemy. They'll bring up Joshua 2 about Jericho. 
It was protecting them from God's judgment, not from the enemy. And then it'll bring up Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, and then you point out to them the fact that it's talking about the accusations of the enemy are not successful because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, meaning it was applied by the Lord because they met the conditions so that they were in a cleansed state and therefore their accusations were groundless. And it did not stop the works because it says that they love their lives not unto the death. Those are the things that you need to be established in so that you don't get deceived by any of the false teaching. It's astounding that we see that the body of Christ has believed these kind of things. And I hear it all the time. I heard it almost every week. I hear somebody when I'm talking to, they'll talk to me about how they're pleading the blood of Jesus over, some, you know. And they're wondering why they're not getting victory and things like that. Well, I pled the blood of Jesus, you know. You hear it all the time. It's just, it's almost an accepted a reality that you're, everybody's supposed to do that when it's a totally false tradition of men. So therefore, if, you've ever, if you are doing that, I trust that you've turned away from it at this point and you realize it is a false tradition of men. Let's give a summary now about what the blood does for us. It's important that you understand that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17 Verse 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. That means that blood shed would release life. That's why Jesus in dying had to shed his blood because that life had to be shed. Remember, the wages of sin is death, and the only way that redemption could be accomplished is somebody had to give their life. Well, blood is going to be shed that's going to release life. Remember that the status of man, of course, after the fall was that not only did he, they spiritually died immediately, but Romans 5, 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin. So death passed upon all men. Everybody's in that status of spiritual death and would die physically then, for that all have sinned. We also see the fact that, as we saw, that there is an understanding that, that they could be redeemed, which we'll see the scripture in a moment, but this is what God said to them. All they knew about was redemption by payment of money to recover lands or possessions or things. Isaiah 52, 3, thus saith the Lord, We've, you've sold yourselves for naught. They sold themselves. Man sold himself into the hands of the devil by disobedience to God's word. But you shall be redeemed without money. Well, they wouldn't have understood that at all because all they knew was redemption by money. Then, of course, Leviticus. In Leviticus chapter 25, we see, remember God had already set things up in the very beginning. Spiritual law was set for whatever would happen. And here's the spiritual law regarding redemption of a brethren who had sold himself. Leviticus 25, 48, after that he sold, his man was sold in the hands of the devil, he may be redeemed again. Who could do it? One of his brethren may redeem him. Could any person who was alive from mankind do it? No, he was in spiritual death. But who could do it? A brethren could. So what had to happen? God had to come and become a man. And he's the man, Christ Jesus, who accomplished this tremendous work and brought forth the redemption. And this is what Jesus did. This is why in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, it declares, This man, after he had offered one sacrifice, only one, not ongoing sacrifices as they did in the Old Testament, for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. He offered the one sacrifice, a blood shed, releasing life that did away with the sin. This is the ransom price having been paid. Hebrews 9, 12, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He got it for all of mankind. And what did he do? He was actually paying the price because God's standard of judgment was you're under death until someone could come and accomplish the redemption. 
So the, you under, must understand what this is saying in Colossians 1.20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. Peace, what peace with who? Peace with God. Somebody had to make peace with God by paying the redemptive price. And Jesus was the one who was the man who came, the kinsman redeemer, who made peace with God through the blood of his Christ in order to see all things, the reconciliation of all things unto himself. And he accomplished that great work. At the same time, not only did he make peace with God, but also he brought the New Testament into being. Remember, the Old Testament was simply pointing towards the one who was going to come. It was, it was a, the law was put in in order to keep the people from walking in the ways of sin. And for the, because of the transgressions, it brought them the fact that they needed a savior, they needed someone who would come and deliver them. Also though, the blood is what brought the New Testament because the Old Testament couldn't produce anything. It couldn't produce righteousness. It couldn't produce eternal life whatsoever. It couldn't produce a new spirit. Matthew 26, 28, this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, talking about mankind. Producing what? The remission of sins, which is the release from bondage and imprisonment. What was the problem with man? He was in bondage and imprisonment because his spirit was not right. He had a sinner spirit. He was under the dominion of the devil. So what was the answer? He had to get a new spirit. And who could get the new spirit for him? Only the Lord could accomplish this. And how was this done? Because he was having accomplished the redemption, then he was the first one who was born from spiritual death unto spiritual life as we see in Revelation 1, verse 5, that is, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, and the firstborn. First begotten means the firstborn out of the dead ones. Remember, this is talking about the dead ones, plural, adjective, the dead ones. So, he's the one who accomplished this. He's the firstborn out of the dead. He became the firstborn of all creation, remember? Because what was the answer? What had to happen? And when you're preaching the gospel to people, you talk about what Jesus did, but you also tell them that there had to be a brand new creation because creation was under the dominion of the devil and spiritually dead. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn. He brought forth the new creation, which had to people, had, man had to get a brand new spirit. And this is why you show people that they had to have to get a brand new spirit being born from above. And also this is how he brought the church, into, which is his body, into being. Colossians 1.18, he's the head of the body of the church, is the beginning, the firstborn out of the dead ones again. And that he, all things, he might have the preeminence. Remember, he is the cornerstone of the church. And the church is the one who are now going to be the ones that are going to be with him. And who are they? They're the righteous ones having been made perfect, as we saw in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. So here we see that the firstborn out of the dead, he brought the church into being. And because of the fact that he accomplished it for us, then receiving him, brings us into relationship with him because he purchased all of us. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost made you for overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Remember, redemption was the purchase of the one who had given himself up, sold himself. So in Jesus accomplishing redemption, that's the purchasing, a buying of us, he purchased us. Now we belong to him. This is why you have to understand that you are not your own. And this is a key. Until you come to the place of realizing you're not your own and you belong to him and total yield of and submission to him, you'll continue to walk in your own human nature way and sin and after the flesh and, and never see God accomplish what he purposes. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. We've been purchased. We belong to Him. You are bought with a price. 
Every one of us were bought with a price, the blood of Jesus. Well, that means if we're not our own, we can't be living unto ourself. We now must be living unto him. That's why you glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You're going to glorify him in everything. Now, having seen what he accomplishes, the blood of Jesus also has effect upon us in our life ongoingly. As we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. Now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus. You've been made nigh unto him. Now you have a free approach because of the blood of Jesus. You've been purchased. You can now can be in that cleansed state because of what he's accomplished for us. And also remember that the blood put us into right relationship with him when we got a brand new spirit. Romans chapter 5 over here in verse 9 indicates, much more than being now justified, and this particular word means to be put into right relationship with God by his blood. We've been put into right relationship now because he accomplished the payment for us and purchased us. And the way, of course, is by receiving him, then that's how, of course, he already purchased us, but by receiving him, we get a brand new spirit. And we now are put into right relationship with God by what he's accomplished for us. Then also, because of the fact that we're in right relationship and we brought near, you now have boldness because of the blood of Jesus to come into the very presence of God. See, you can't just do whatever you want if you're not right with God. Look what it says in Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You can only enter in to take hold of promises, to come into the presence of God by the blood of Jesus. That's why we have to make sure that we have it applied and we're cleansed. Otherwise, we're not going to get an audience with God. Remember, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord's against them that do evil. <laughs> That'd be someone who doesn't have the blood applied, and he would not have any means to be able to enter in to the holy presence of God whatsoever. Another thing we realize is how the blood is applied to us. We see it, it was in the Old Testament, and we see it in the New Testament. Exodus 24, verse 6 to 8, important to realize, where Moses took half the blood, put it in basins, Half the blood he sprinkled on the altar, and then he took the book of the covenant, read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. The covenant that we're under now is the New Testament. We take the book of the New Testament, we read that, we hear the word, we commit that we're going to do it and be obedient, and then what? Then Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made you concerning all these words meaning the blood is going to be applied, and the blood of the covenant, all these promises will come to pass as you're hearing and doing the word. That's why we must be hearers and doers of the word. Those people that aren't hearing and doing the word, they don't have the blood applied to them whatsoever. They may think they do. They're just believing, you know, out of their own mindset that has no bearing on it whatsoever. And we see the same thing as we saw at the beginning here. If we may be walking in the light as he is in the light, walking in the word, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ is cleansing us from all sin. So what brings the blood of Jesus to be cleansing us? Because we're walking in the light. Again, that's because we've heard the word, we're doing the word, we're being obedient in the word, we're walking in it consistently in our life. That's so important. What else is the blood gonna do? The blood is going to do a work in your heart in your conscience to be able to serve the living God. <clears throat> we even see, <clears throat> it's over in um, chapter 10, over here in verse uh, 22. As, as. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So, that's what the blood of Jesus will do. Is it sprinkled? This is the sprinkling from the blood because now we can draw nigh unto him. And of course, when we are walking in the light, the blood's applied and we'll be sprinkled from an evil conscience. And then because of that fact, 
Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? What will it do for us? It will purge or cleanse, this means, your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That means you need to get cleansed from everything that was a dead work, not productive, in order to be able to serve the living God because you gotta get cleansed to be able to serve him. So this is also important to those ones who are getting cleansed, they're gonna be in a position to be used of God to serve him. Some people try to just go and serve God in their sinful state. <laughs> they're just spinning their wheels going nowhere. You've got to have your conscience served, uh, purged out from the dead works to be able to serve the living God. Also, we see the fact that the blood of Jesus is going to work through the covenant relationship to bring a total restoration in your life. Hebrews 13, 20, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. So this blood covenant, because the blood's applied and you're hearing and doing the word, which you're going to see the promises come to pass. See, the covenant promises won't come to pass if you are not right with God whatsoever. In every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ. It's going to bring you to the place of being complete, sound, fit, mended, repaired. To place, you come to the place of being perfected before the Lord, complete, the total work being done in our life. And it's all because of the blood of the covenant. That means we have to have the blood applied to us if we're going to see the covenant promises come to pass. People that don't deal with their sins and they're wondering why they're not seeing covenant promises come to pass, they aren't ever going to see them until they get this. It, the blood has to be applied to keep them right if they're going to see the promises come to pass in their life, which is so important. Also, we see the fact that we must realize that if we do walk in sin, we're going to have judgment. Anybody that thinks that you're not going to have judgment because Jesus supposedly took your judgment on the cross is total lies. Look what it says in Hebrews 10, 26. If we sin willfully, we know what we're doing. After we've received the knowledge, the precise and correct knowledge, that means we know what the Word says, we understand the, the, the precise, correct knowledge of the Word, yet we sinned willfully, voluntarily, we know what we were doing. There remains no more, after knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. That's what they did in the Old Testament. Remember, he's talking to the Hebrews there. That's the way they deal with things. So he's saying, we don't do that now, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment. Remember in the Old Testament, God, after their sins, God would wink at sin, and there was a passing over or disregarding of it in the sense because they would not, because of the fact that they, they, did, they weren't born again, they weren't in a position of having relationship with Him and right relationship. All there could be would be a covering over, but not a doing away of it. But now, He calls for everybody to repent. Remember, this is what it says. It's over in Acts chapter 17, in verse 30, where it says, The time of this ignorant God winked at, and now He commands all men everywhere to repent. Everybody's got to repent and turn because now we have been released from the bondage and imprisonment of sin. We are not a sinner any longer. Now we can conquer all sin. In fact, we are to not let any sin have dominion over us anymore. And remember also, he's appointed a day and he's going to judge the world in righteousness. Everybody will be judged by righteousness, by the man whom he hath ordained, who's given assurance unto all men that they raised him from the dead. So this means that everybody has to deal with their sins. Now this does bring us just a comment, the teaching that says the fact that, well, now that we have Jesus Christ, as He paid the price for the sins, and He made peace now with God, all our sins are forgiven past, present, and future. That teaching has gone forth in the body of Christ. It is a lie. It is a doctrine of the devil. Our sins are not forgiven past, present, and future that you and I might commit. Our sins will be only forgiven when we have met the conditions 
for it. And the blood of Jesus will only be applied when we are walking in the light continually to see then that the blood will be applied because we're right with him. So if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice for sins, but a fearful looking for of judgment. Judgment will come and fiery indignation. It can come in all kinds of ways. It can come as not seeing promises come to pass, seeing problems, calamities, sickness, disease, all kinds of different things, hindrances, all types of situations that just don't seem to work out in your life. You've got all kinds of things happening. God's not manifested himself in, different, in things the way you think he should. Why? <clears throat> there's always a reason, remember. And if there's any curses, the curse causeless does not come. There's always a cause for it, remember. It's not just coming automatically or whatever. There's always a cause for it. Judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. This is why sin has to be dealt with. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Remember, they'd stone him. They'd kill him, you know. They would do that in the Old Testament. Of how much sore punishment, how much sore or worse punishment that means. You mean there's worse punishment that could come for us? Suppose you, shall you, he be thought worthy or fit for, who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified a, not unholy thing, but a common thing. It means common, koinos, from where we get the word koinonia, but common. And have done despite, this word means insult under the spirit of grace. So what's this talking about? This is talking about the guy who sins willfully. If we sin willfully after we receive the precise, correct knowledge of the truth, we're going to, have to see nothing but a fearful looking for of judgment. And then he says, of how much worse punishment suppose you he be thought worthy of. And what has he done? He's trodden underfoot the Son of God. How do you trodden under the, the foot the Son of God? When you sin. When you don't do the word, you're essentially trodden him underfoot instead of doing the word and being obedient. And counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified a common thing. Because the blood is not going to be applied to you anymore. You kind of cast off that from cleansing you. So is it a common thing? No, it's a holy thing. It has to be applied to you for you to be right with God. And has done insult under the spirit of grace. And what does the Holy Spirit, remember this is a time of grace. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's the favor of God. Just the grace of God going to be manifest to you automatically just because you're born again, as some people tell you out there? No. You can insult the spirit of grace who wants to bring the grace of God to you because you didn't walk in line with the word of God to see it. Remember, it's the word of his grace that will build you up and give you your inheritance. It's supposed to give it to you, but if you don't meet the conditions, it's not going to happen. Remember, grace might reign through righteousness. We talked about that out of Romans chapter 5, verse 21. So, this tells us we've got to deal with sin. If we, don't, if we walk in sin, is the blood applied to us? No. The blood of Jesus is absolutely essential to be applied to you for you to be right with God. That's why we have to deal with all sin in our life. It is mandatory in every situation. Now, look at these scriptures. In Revelation, chapter 7, verse 13. Here's the view in heaven of those ones who are arrayed in white robes. One of the elders answered and said to me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And where, from where did they come from? This is talking about during the tribulation period. I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. They were in it. They apparently got martyred. But notice, they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, meaning they were right with God, and that's why they're in heaven. If they weren't right with God, they wouldn't be in heaven, that's for sure. They washed their robes. Well, how would I wash my robes? By dealing with the sin, by turning away from con confessing the sin, getting the cleansing by the blood of Jesus that would make them white, in the blood of the Lamb. 
That is important to realize. Remember, if we go back for a moment to John, what Jesus said. He said quite an st important statement. In John chapter 13, verse 10, where he talked about he that has been bathed. Remember the word washed is luo, meaning bathed. He that was bathed needs not to be bathed again, talking about, except for what? To wash his feet. Well, that's his walk. And why is that so important? Because verse 8, when Jesus answered Peter, when he said, you'll never wash my feet, Jesus said, if I wash thee not, if you don't get cleansed, by the blood of Jesus because of being washed. You have no part with me. Will those people, somebody who's not cleansed be in heaven? No way. You're not going to have any part with him at all, whatsoever. You're going you're to be cast out instead. We see another thing over in Revelation. This is important for us, not only in our life now, but in down the road, you have to realize the only ones even though a person might get martyred, that doesn't mean you're going to heaven. If you're not right with God, you're not going to go to heaven. This is the sixth, fifth seal. And by the way, don't expect that all these things are going to happen immediately when the tribulation comes. The first four seals are opened up first. The fifth seal was down the road before the sixth seal comes and the seventh seal when we see when the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air and things are done. When he opened the fifth seal, this is down the road, I saw into the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. They cried with a loud voice, saying, O long, O how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That means they've been killed. White robes were given unto every one of them. Why? Because they had been right with God. The key will be you've got to stay right with God all the days of your life, regardless of what happens, so you'll go to heaven. The blood must be applied to you so you have a white robe. Only those with a white robe are going to make it. In Revelation 7, we see in verse 9, After this I beheld and glow a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, peoples, tongues, stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. Who's going to be there? Only the ones that have white robes because they've been cleansed, because they are righteous. The blood has been applied. They've been made them white in the blood of the Lamb, as we saw. And also, who then is going to make it to heaven in the, in the marriage of the Lamb? Revelation 19, 7, Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself or did make herself ready. To her was granted she should be arrayed in fine linen. Why? Well, first of all, what fine linen means? Clean and white. Why? For the fine linen is the righteous acts, remember. This talks about the righteous acts because it is plural. The righteous acts of who? The saints who are who? The holy ones. Who's holy? the ones that are righteous and holy because the blood has been applied and they have been cleansed. They are in that state. That is why it is absolutely mandatory for you and I to walk in the ways of the Lord at all times and to see the blood of Jesus Christ applied to us. And remember, who's in heaven again? Come back to Hebrews chapter 12. These are the people that are in heaven. The General Assembly and Church of Firstborns. Anybody that's not a firstborn, no way they're getting there. But not just because they're a firstborn. I mean, that's, that's, part, that's the first step. The God, the judge of all. Oh, he's, he's going to judge everybody. The spirits of who? The righteous ones. The righteous ones here. It's down here. Adjective, plural, the righteous ones. Well, who are they? The ones that have been doing righteousness, the ones that have the fruits of righteousness, the ones that are walking right. And if you're walking right, you're, walking, you're not walking in sin. Of the righteous ones, having been made perfect. This is the word for perfection. 
and it's a perfect tense, meaning this completed action in the past with the present results at the time of speaking. When was it completed in the past? When they were walking their walk here on earth. Not when they got to heaven. It was before. Have the work accomplished in the past with present results at the time of speaking, see? And this shows that it's the passive voice, meaning it's God's work that was accomplished in them, remember. He's the one that does the work as you do the word. You put him in operation to accomplish it. So the righteous ones, having been made perfect by the Lord in the past with present results at the time of speaking. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and the blood of sprinkling, because it's all coming from Jesus, the blood is his blood that is being applied. We have nothing to do with the blood. Anybody thinks you do something with the blood has just been totally deceived. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He is the one who takes the blood of sprinkling and applies it. And it does speak of better things than that of Abel's. God wants us to come to the place of realizing that we need to put the word of God first place and walk in it so the blood's applied. And we can't just ignore what he says. Look at the next verse says, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. We can't be refusing him that tells us all these things of what, we, what we're to be doing so we're right with him and cleansed. If they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, and they didn't, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. <laughs> we won't. The word of God is given to us to show us how we walk, what we do, what we follow after, what we obey. And remember, the proof of us is whether we're obedient in all things. That shows whether you're truly walking in line with the word or not. Now remember, how am I going to be protected? Number one, I'm going to walk in line with the word of God so the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us and keep us in that cleansed state. At the same time, the angels, you have to understand, they are going to carry out the Word of God. And we even see, we looked at a couple of scriptures before, but let's look at a few more scriptures on this. Exodus 23, verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep or guard you in the way. Who will guard us in the way? Angels will guard us if we've done what's necessary to put them in operation and to bring you unto the place I prepared. God's prepared things for us and the angels go before us, but not only guard us, but bring us to the place to see these things, all the things that God's prepared to come to pass. Beware of him and obey his voice because they would be speaking the word in the Old Testament. So what this means? Well, you've got to obey the voice of the word. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. In other words, he's not going to automatically do this because he's been sent before you to bring you to the place prepared. It's because you've obeyed the word of God that they're going to perform the word as you're walking in line with it. It's not going to happen if you're going to be disobedient, that's for sure. If you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, that's the key. Obedience and doing what God's word says. Then will I be an enemy unto thy enemies and an adversary to thine adversaries. The angels are going to protect you. They're going to fight on your behalf. The warring angels will fight on your behalf to deliver you. Mine angels shall go before thee. And are they going to take you away from your enemies? Actually, they're not going to take you away from your enemies. They're going to bring you in against your enemies. Bring you in unto the Amorites, Kittites, Hivites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites, Parasites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites, and I will cut them off. God's going to cut off all the enemies. Otherwise, you're going to wipe them out. You are to conquer. You're not to run away from the enemies. You're to conquer your enemies. So don't be surprised about the enemies that you have to deal with. Everything has to be dealt with. God will lead you to conquer everything. And remember what these angels do. They are mighty. They are full of power. Psalms 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel. This is the word gabor, meaning they're strong and mighty. They're strong and mighty in 
koak, which is a word for power, meaning a manifested power. They are strong and mighty in manifested power that do his commandments and they hearken to the voice of the word. So if you're doing the commandments, they're going to go in operation to perform those things that you're doing on your behalf and they're going to hearken to the voice of the word. Remember that what happens when you yourself are speaking the word. Luke chapter 12, remember Jesus is in our high priestly ministry. This is why we don't pray to Jesus. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, bringing his high priestly ministry into operation. Jesus said, whoever will confess me, is the word, before men, him shall the Son of Man confess before the angels. What will the angels do? Go forth to perform the word, to hearken to the voice of the word, to do his commandments, to accomplish, to deliver us, to bring us to the place of where he's prepared for us, keep us, guard us in the way, all these things that we see that the angels will do. And it doesn't matter how many evil spirits are arrayed against you. You can conquer them all. Isaiah 37, verse 36, look what it says. 36. The angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and four score and five thousand. That's 185,000 enemies. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many are arrayed against you. You can conquer everything. Don't be moved by the enemies attacking you or what seems to be a whole lot coming at you or how much you have in you from inheritance that you're having to deal with, you know, if you're dealing with inherited generational iniquity curses. You just go after them and keep staying after them. He's going to deliver you. He smote them. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. See, you've got to realize your faith will put the angels in operation to deliver you. In fact, you've got to get your faith developed because look what it says here in Hebrews chapter 11 when we see what was happening. These guys that went forth in faith, through faith they subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness, they obtained promises, they stopped the mouth of lions, which put the angels in operation, remember? Quenched the violence of fire. Doesn't matter what's coming at you. Escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong and dunamo. Waxed valiant, became mighty and forceful in war. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. They're coming after me. <laughs> I command you to be turned and move, removed in the name of Jesus. <laughs> God is a mighty God. Angels are mighty angels that can conquer. They can deliver you from everything and anything if you meet the conditions. You must understand. You can put the angels in operation. Jesus understood that. Matthew 26, verse 53, that's 26. Here's Jesus, they're coming to get him, take him, of course, what's he say? Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father that he shall presently give me more, more than 12 legions of angels? A legion was like 6,866, uh, uh, I think it was, a soldier, six, 26 soldiers. Well, 12 times that, that's about 80,000 angels. So I could pray, he'd send 80,000 angels here to deal with this. He must add a revelation. To, that's what angels it would take to deal with everything that was arrayed against him. God can bring whatever needs to be done to deliver you. You've got to understand, who protects you? Angels. Why has anybody ignored all this and thought that they're going to plead the blood and do all the other things they think, which have no scriptural basis whatsoever? It's the angels that you're going to put in operation. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. And it's important to understand what's actually being said in the Greek. This is talking about angels. Are they not all serving spirits or ministering spirits? They're, they're serving God to bring forth things for you. They're sent forth to minister for them it says who shall be heirs of salvation but literally what it says is this they've been sent forth 
here because of the going about. This is a word mean to be going forth, to be going about, to receive or to inherit, because this is this word for inheritance, to be inheriting since it's a present tense infinitive. It's an infinitive. Salvation. In other words, what this is saying is the angels are sent forth and actually this is the word because this is accusative means because of. They're sent forth because of those going about ongoingly to be inheriting salvation. Well, who's going about to be inheriting salvation? You and me. What happens when that we're going about ongoingly to be inheriting our, our uh, salvation? The angels. The angels are going to be then sent forth to minister for us to see our salvation come to pass. All the promises, everything that he has for us. Angels will bring all these things to pass. So therefore, you must know it's angels that protect you. It's angels that are going to go on forth and minister for you. Angels are mighty. They're the ones that we're going to be putting in operation by speaking, doing the word, going forth. They're doing his commandments. They're hearkening to the voice of the word. We're praying the word. Angels are going to accomplish these things. So this is important to understand so you don't fall for any of the traditions of men and think that you were supposed to be pleading the blood when that's a false tradition. It's not the truth. I trust this has helped you so you understand the unscriptural tradition of pleading the blood and you also see that it all comes down to the blood being applied because you've dealt with sin and you're walking in line with the Word of God. You have confessed your sins. You have repented. You've turned away from it. You are. You've got cleansed from all unrighteousness. You're walking in the way of the Lord. The blood will be applied when you meet the conditions and then you are right with God. And because of that, now you have the way into the holiest to be able to take all of the promises, take that mercy, find grace to help in time and need, going about to possess all your inheritance and conquer all the enemies in your life and see the total salvation of the Lord come forth for you. That's what God will do. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the truth about the blood. I understand pleading the blood is a false doctrine. I understand in Exodus 12 they were being protected by God from God's judgment. In Joshua 2 they were protected from God's judgment. In Revelation 12 11, Satan's accusations were not effective because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony as they were walking in line with the word, the blood was applied. I understand the blood of Jesus is applied by Jesus where it's at the mercy seat when we meet the conditions, which are when we're walking in the light as he is in the light, hearing and doing the word, obedient to the word, then the blood will be applied. And if we do sin, which we don't have to sin, but if we might sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous, our heavenly attorney, that when we meet the conditions, he will apply the blood and cleanse us so we confess our sins and we come to a godly sorrow, working true repentance, turning away from it and walking in the way of righteousness and getting cleansed from all unrighteousness so the blood will be applied. I thank you that I have been redeemed, I have been reconciled, I have been put in right relationship by the blood of Jesus. I am now in the New Testament with all the promises and I have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. I have boldness to enter the presence of God by the blood of Jesus and it will keep me cleansed and it will purge my conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I thank you that the blood of the covenant, as I am walking in line with it and taking hold of the promises, it is restoring me, it is mending me, it is completing me, it is perfecting me in every good work to do his will, working in me, 
that which is pleasing in his sight. I also understand, if I sin willfully, then I have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and I have counted the blood that sanctified me as a common thing, and done insult to the Spirit of grace, and hindered the grace of God from coming forth in my life. I will never insult the Spirit of grace. The blood is holy. It is not a common thing. It has sanctified me to make me holy. Therefore, I will not sin willfully after I have the knowledge of the truth. I will always obey the Word of God. And if I might son, sin, I will immediately confess that sin, repent and turn away from it, and meet the conditions so that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me so I will be right with the Lord. I thank you. I understand pleading the blood is a lie. It is the angels that will guard me, that will deliver me, that will protect me, that will fight for me, that will be working as I'm going about to be possessing the inheritance. They will bring the salvation into manifestation. I understand the blood of Jesus Christ in heaven speaks of better things, of mercy, and of all the promises that God wants to bring forth because of the blood covenant. I thank you that I will make sure the blood of Jesus Christ is applied, keeping me cleansed, because I'm walking in line with the Word of God ongoingly, having met the conditions. And as I speak the Word, and I do everything in the name of Jesus, the promises will be coming to pass. I'll conquer all the enemies. The angels will be going forth, warring on my behalf, and delivering me, and springing forth what God purposes for me into manifestation. Thank you, Father. I reject the lying traditional teaching that we're to plead the blood. It has no scriptural basis. It is a doctrine of the devil. Thank you for establishing me in the truth so I won't follow false traditions. But I will do what the Word says. The blood will continue to be applied by Jesus in my life. And I will see the promises come to pass and the angels working on my behalf. Thank you for establishing me in the truth regarding the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God for the blood of Jesus. It has done tremendous things for us. And it's astounding that people think that they can do something with it themselves for their own selfish gain, you know. Protect me, all these kind of things, think they can do something with it without meeting any conditions whatsoever. Thank you, Father, for the truth. Thank you for exposing the false traditions. Thank you that we will never be pleading the blood because we know it's a lie. We will always be doing what is right in your sight so that the blood applies to us and be cleansing us because of we met the conditions. We also will make sure we're not trotting underfoot the Son of God by sinning. We thank you. The blood is a holy thing and we thank you that it will continually be applied in our life because we are walking in the light as you are in the light. Thank you, Father, for bringing forth the continual working of the blood of Jesus Christ in us as we have the boldness to come into the very presence of God and take hold of every promise because of the blood that has kept us clean. And we will be cleansed and stay cleansed through the tribulation period so that we will be in heaven. Thank you, Father, for this great work you're accomplishing. We will make sure that the blood is applied in us to keep us cleansed at all times. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.